God, I feel so privileged to stand here. I've had some, some great words uh, from this platform. I've, my life's been changed by listening to, to words brought on this platform, so I hope I can do it justice. Now, I am a man, as Josh said, of practicalities, so Easter Day, the clocks are going forward, so if you don't want to turn up halfway through the service, uh, remember that one, but iPhones, Android does it for you. <laughs> anyway, moving on. You know what? We've been talking about obedience, and obedience to me has always been a hard word. You know, it's, it's not something that we like to talk about. It's kind of viewed quite negatively. It's easy to think about rules and regulations and, and laws and legalism. Now, I'm going to define some scenarios, and I'm going to bet that most of you can identify with at least one of them. I think I can identify with all of them. I'm going to guess at some point in your life you've been told to stop chatting in your class, even though you know that your conversation about what's just happened in One Tree Hill is more important than learning about calculus. Amen, Emma. Maybe I'm showing my age, once you're here, or maybe something else now. Do you see? No. Um, as an aside, calculus is very important. I use it every day in my life. I'm an engineer. Uh, but for most people, I get it's not. Or maybe, hopefully when you're a little kid, but maybe in your 20s, uh, you've been told to stop crying in the supermarket and making a scene. Even though you know that it is very important that you have the chance to grieve that there is no monster munch in stock. Exactly. We all want monster munch. Maybe you've been told that you need to stop playing FIFA because you need to go buy chocolate for your wife. I identify it as not a bad thing. Jen wanted to mention in the preach, and I'm not sure she was expecting that. Maybe you've been told to shut up because no one cares what you're saying. Maybe you've been told that your opinion doesn't matter and what you have to say doesn't contribute to the conversation, so it's better if you don't talk and people just rule straight over you. You know what, it's so easy for us to believe that to be obedient is to serve someone else for their desires, their, their aims, their ambitions, their dreams. That it's to die to everything that you want, that, that you feel called to, that everything that you feel is a desire in your heart. And it's so easy to project that onto God. You know what? In a lot of times, that is why we're told to obey in, in the natural. Sometimes it comes from such bad motives, you know, a bully who's been bullied and then they have the opportunity to control someone else. So they're going to tell them to do exactly what they can just because. It happens, I'm not going to deny that it happens, but I know that it doesn't happen with God. With God, we can stand assured that when he asks you to obey, it is for your benefit. It's for the benefit of those that love God. It says in Jeremiah, it says, but I gave them this command, obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. There's a clear action in that. It says, walk in obedience to all I command you. But there's also a reason given that it may go well with you. There's something so positive, so clear, that there's a precedent set that says that if God's heart behind asking you to obey him is that he may bless you through it. You know what, when, when God created the world, he didn't need us. We weren't part of that process. If God's infinity, then God plus us is nothing more than that. We're not an important part of, of the universe in terms of power, in terms of might, in terms of magnitude, like we're nothing. So it's not that God needs us to obey him so that he's got an army rising up. He chooses us and asks us to obey him because he wanted someone to be in a relationship with. He created his people that he could have a relationship with and love upon, and we would love him back. And that's, that's where it comes from. That's the root of obedience. That's the reason for obedience. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. Do you know what? It's really important to know that that's not a threat. In no way is that God saying, hey, 
do what I tell you or else. Instead, it's a promise. It's a promise that we can stand on, that we can rely on, that, hey, you do what I say, and I will abundantly bless you. It will go so well with you. That's so crucial to me. If there's one person I want to hear that from, it's not, it's not my boss, it's not the pastor of the church, it's the creator of the universe. You know, he's so big, he does everything on this macro scale, but he also does it on the micro scale. He does everything on such a detailed level. He says, it will go well with you, and he doesn't forget a single part of it. But you know, I'm like, I want to know why. As a kid, it was almost my question. I'm like, I want to know why. Tell me why. Why does this work? Why is it broken? Tell me why. So I'm like, God, tell me why. Like, what's, what is it that's going to go well? So I'll let you know the secret. I asked him. And I'm going to read what he said back. He said, I want my children to know that I love them and that I have incredible plans for them. Their plans that benefit my children. And that's what I heard. You know, that to me, asking God, saying, what's, what's the essence of this, this message? Like, what's important here? And that's the line I got. If you forget everything else, then that's, that's the key. I want my children to know that I love them and that I have incredible plans for them. They're plans that benefit my children. And if you read it and, and you know your Bible very well, then, then you might recognize it. It's kind of similar to a verse in Jeremiah 29 that says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for hope and a future. I'm like, great, great line, one of my favorite verses. I'm like, it tells me exactly what I need to do in, in order for it to go well in my life. But then I felt God saying, hey, David, just wait and, and change that word plans and say blueprints. Now, a blueprint is a design for a house or a building. So if we change it, we say blueprints or designs. It says, so I know the designs that I have for you. They are designs to prosper you and not to harm you. They are designs for a hope and for a future. Do you know what? I found another translation that I loved, and it said, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They are thoughts for good and not for evil. And it suddenly, it stopped becoming about, about what I needed to do to, to obey God and to, to live, like, come to the fulfillment of what he had for me. But it suddenly became about understanding who he's created me. Like what the design of David was. The man that, that he wants me to step into and be. And instead of being my, my path to, to how to obey, it suddenly became my reason to obey. And that's something that is really strong in my heart. Like I've just been thinking a lot about it through the week, but, but for, through the last few years as well that I want to step into everything that he has for me and I want to see other people do the same. Like, that's what I want to come and I really want it to come and share and say, hey, I'm, I'm in the process of realizing this and I want everyone else to as well. Because I start to see the blueprints, the designs for, that God has for each of your lives. You, know, you see people here and you're like, wow, you think you're worthless, but I'm starting to see that God's got so much for you and the person that he created you for is greatness. The design of everyone in this room is greatness. And obedience, obedience is the path that we can take to allow God to shape us into that. If you want to start to walk in the fullness of everything that God has for you, it takes obedience. It takes saying, God, all right, I want everything that you have. So I'm going to follow you. I'm going to try and hear your voice. And I'm going to let you do this. So how do we obey? Well, in Corinthians it says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And I love that, that line. I use it a lot when I'm thinking of, you know, is this right or is this right or is that wrong? What's wrong? What's right? I don't really know. I've got two options. I don't know what's godly. I don't know what's not godly. And I'm a bit confused. I don't know whether this is in the law or it's outside the law. I can come back to this verse where it says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And to me, that, that takes it away from all the rules 
And it just comes to, you know, what benefits me and, and what benefits my relationship with God because any action I take, I want it to benefit my relationship with God. I only want to take actions in my life that benefit me and, and benefit that relationship. And that can be general. You know, there are some things you're like, you know what I know pretty clear that this is going to benefit my relationship with God. There's some things you can be like, off the bat, don't, don't murder anyone. Yeah, that's going to benefit my relationship with God. We're going to go there. We're not going to, I'm confused. Uh, we're, we're not going to murder anyone. You know, that benefits my relationship with God. Or a specific, you know, there are, there are things that God's spoken into your life specifically that you're like, I want to seek God on a decision. I want to know what he's saying to me. I want to know, like, which direction to, to take. I don't want to take a, a, any step that's going to, going to take me away from that. I don't want to commit to, to anything that's going to stop me reaching what God's had for me. But on the other side, I do want to take every step that's going to get me there. And there we've got to seek God and we've got to pray. And, you know, Jesus said, I only do what I've heard my father say. You know, he's, he's very clear that he's only going to take actions that, that benefit him and that benefit his father. And he took that all the way. He took that to the cross. You know, there, when he's there in the garden in Gethsemane, he's making decisions. He's saying, I'm only going to do what I see my father say. And that's, you know, that's, that's gone so powerful. That's gone so deep. It's affected everyone in this room. You know, we're not, we're not saved through obedience. We're saved by grace. It's not about what we do. It never has been. But there's a relationship, there's closeness with him. So obedience positions ourselves to receive the fullness of what God has for our lives. Obedience allows us to come close. And that's a place of safety and of security. Obedience offers us protection. It says in Psalms, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and the one who rescues me. My God, my rock and strength in whom I trust and take refuge. You know, I think that's David speaking in the Psalms. It might not be, but it probably is. He wrote most of them. Uh, and David went through a heck of a lot in his life. Like he was, he was chased. You know, Saul was trying to kill him most of the time, it seemed. The next minute he'd be best friends. But like, you know, he went through a lot. His son tried to take his throne. But he still came to, to God and could say, my God is my rock. He's my refuge. Now, there's something special about a castle. You know, if we're thinking fortress, we're thinking castles. They're only useful if you're inside of them. If you've ever played any military strategy games, Age of Empires, something like that, you know, you're, you're building your army and there's rival armies and you're all trying to take each other out. So you build like this really big fort and then you realize that you've left half a dozen troops outside that fort and it does absolutely nothing for them. You know they're gone, the first one's out. So this fortress that is God, this refuge that God is God that we can abide in, that we can dwell in, is only, is only any use to us if we're in it. You know, if we, if we go real Old Testament, we're going Genesis. Noah. God had a real big plan for Noah. God said, humanity is pretty messed up. I'm going to start again, and I'm going to start again with Noah. He had designs and plans for Noah's life. He said, you're a man of greatness. I'm going to take you there. But, Noah, you're going to have to be obedient to me if you ever want to reach that. Because God said to Noah, Noah, I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a really, really, really big ship in the middle of the land where there's not much water. I think it might have been a drought. And people were je uh, like jeering at him and just being like, Noah, why are you doing that? It's so, so, so stupid. If you ever think that Evan Almighty is a direct comparison, that there's not really any similarity there. Um, but there is a big boat, so if you want to... See a big boat. Check out that film. Um, but, but God says to because <laughs> I don't know why I said any of that. Um, God says to Noah, look, obey me, and it will go well with you. 
you know, follow my commands, so, as we said in Jeremiah, follow my commands, do the all I command you to do, and it will go well with you. Now, if Noah disobeyed God there, if he hadn't have done it, it doesn't matter how good a swimmer he was. He was not surviving that flood. You know, it wiped everything off the face of the earth if they weren't in a massive great ark. So it's a real practical example in the Bible of saying how obedience offers protection. If he didn't do it, he was gonna. That's not to say that that place of protection is necessarily sweet and lovely. If you close your eyes and imagine that you're in a big, big wooden boat, and there's at least two of all the animals that they could find or ever existed. I think some of the animals, there are seven of them. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and there was a long period after that that they couldn't find land. I'm just going to put it out there. I think it really badly smelled on that boat. I never want to come up here and say that that when you're obedient to God, you're protected and it all smells like roses. I, you know, I can look in my life and say, hey God, I know you were protecting me there, but I still, I still felt hurt. I still, like, it was not a nice situation. If you've ever been put somewhere and you're like, I know God's told me to be here, but I really don't know why because it feels like a really bad situation. I bet David thought that a lot. Like, he's like, oh God, you're my refuge and my strength, but I'm hiding in a cave. You know, if, if God's your refuge and you're in this castle, well, you might well be under siege. That's not a, it's not a pretty place to be. It's not a beautifully smelling place to be necessarily. But it is safe and it is secure because it's in the Father. When the Israelites were crossing in the desert, it was a journey, I can't remember how many days, but it was, it was less than like two weeks. It might have been 11, it might have been three. Um, and that was a journey that it should have taken to get from Egypt to the land of captivity, across this wilderness, to the promised land, the, the place that God has said, hey, follow me and it will go well with you. And they got to the edge, and they sent some spies in, and they, they had a little look around, and they said, no. That is not for us. There are giants there. So, they didn't obey what God commanded. Instead, they thought, nope, we, we can't do that. Like, that is not something that we are capable of going through. We're not going to win there. We're not going to trust what God has said. So, we're going to step out. There was only Joshua and Caleb who said, yeah, we can take them. I don't know if that was bravado or really hearing the voice of God. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, and there was a consequence to that. You know, all, the, all that generation that said, no, we can't do it, they never entered the promised land. That disobedience had a direct cost, and that cost was that they never entered the fullness of what God had for them. But that doesn't mean that God forgot the Israelites. You know what, they spent 40 years wandering around that desert, and God... God directed them the whole way. He, he provided, like, he, he rested in a pillar of cloud during the day so they could see and, and follow, and during the night so they could travel at night. Uh, it was a pillar of fire. Now, I'm going to put it out there, and this is not directly scriptural, but it's much of my thinking, that that was more than just, like, vision for direction. I'm going to put it out there that in a desert... In the day, it gets pretty hot. It's not a big step to say it's going to be really hot, but if you've got a big pillar of, of cloud, I'm saying there's a good chance that you can get some shelter if you're near that. There's a benefit to coming close. There's a benefit of saying, hey, I want to be at the front of that. I want to be at the front of, of what you're doing, of where you're going, because I want to be in the shelter. And then if you imagine it's nighttime and there's a big pillar of fire, well, it gets pretty cold in the desert as well. I want to be pretty close to that. I want to be close to that warmth. Like it's important to be warm and, 
And right there at the back where they're just kind of, yeah, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. You know, they were all being obedient. They were all following this direction. But there were going to be some there at the front and there was going to be some at the back. So I'm going to suggest that there's a real big benefit to getting close in. Close in to where, where God's going to what the Father's doing. That protection that's there. So I can summarize it like this. If you live a life that intentionally positions yourself in a place where you can come into the shelter of God, there is nothing that can form against you that has a chance to prosper. Like straight out, there is nothing that has a chance to prosper. It can come against you. There's nothing stopping that. You ask Job. So much came against him, but it never prospered. It never made it. It never, it never won the fight because he was protected in God. If you position yourself in a place where you can come into his shelter, you know, it talks in Psalms, it says, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Like, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to spend my life. That's where I want to spend all my time. I want to say, hey, God, I love what you're doing. I love who you are, and I've seen some amazing things that you're doing in my life and, and in those around me. I've seen some incredible things that God's doing in the people of Joshua generation. I want to be under the shadow of your wings. And I know that to get there, I need to hear your voice, and I need to know your call, and I need to know what it is that you're saying to me so that I can obey it. And no longer has it become this dirty word that, that I don't want anything to do with, but, but instead it's the root to my safety and my protection and my security. So I can stand and I can say whatever, whatever he says. Whatever he says. And it could be so varied. You know, it's different for every one of you here what he's saying to you right now. Whatever he says, I want to obey it. Because I know in my heart, in my very core, in my very being, that it benefits me. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. So we're going to end really right now. I'm just going to pray. Like, If you want to come up afterwards, Phil and his prophetic team uh, will be down the front over here. And be so willing to, to pray and prophesy into your life, into any situations. If any of this has challenged anything in your heart that you just want to process with people, uh, then, then feel more than free to come up. Or if it's if they've given you anything that you'll go away and process during the week, that's amazing. Come chat to your life group leaders about it. Um, either tonight or on Wednesday, over the break, send them a text. But we're just going to pray. Father, I thank you that your plan is to benefit us. You have designs for our lives that are for good and not for evil. I thank you that you speak to us and when we obey your command, we're in a place to receive all that you have for us. I thank you that we're protected when we come close to you. Father, even if it's a hard place, even when it's a place where it's hard to see where you are, I can trust that you cover us. So, Father, during this week, would you show us the designs that you have for our lives? Would you show us how to hear your voice and come close to you? Would you show us the path to, to obeying you in the art of obedience? Father, in your name. Amen.